verse 6 through to the end, which is verse 15. Let me remind you, this is the Word of God. So if you're slouching, sit up. If you're not lacking focus, tune in. You will not hear anything more important than this. So the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will, uh, sorry, uh, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And turn with me, if you would, to that part of the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And as you do that, just a warm welcome to you all. Good to see you. So we're going to continue in this part of the the Bible here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. We started that last week um, as we continue on this theme of giving. What the Bible, what the Lord has to say to us about money and giving and all those kinds of things is completely different to what we find in the world. So we do need God's help if we're going to kind of tune in, as it were, don't we? So please join me. Let's bow our heads. Let's not be presumptuous. Let's ask the law to help us. In Romans it says, I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, we've just sung about God's amazing grace, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God. Um, Thank you that you are good and all your ways are good. And we ask that you would lead us in truth now. And Lord, we pray that we might expect our minds to be transformed as you work by your spirit through your word. Lord, help us, we pray. Open our ears, open our hearts, and give us a zeal to glorify you as we sit under your word together now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to begin like this this morning. Um, have you ever had that experience where you've gone to the to see a film at the cinema and um, and it's it's really moved you? It's a film that's really moved you, so that when you come out into the light and your eyes are like little slits as you come out into the light, um, your whole way of thinking has kind of changed as a result of this film that you've seen and the impact that it's had on you. Have you had that feeling before? And, and from that point onwards, you know that because of that experience, things are going to be different as you look out and see. There's a way that you were looking at the world before you went into the cinema, which now as you come out is just different. Everything's changed in that way. Have you ever had that experience before? You're probably not going to get it with Romeo and Juliet. 
Um, we're not talking that sort of film, but you know the kind of film, the kind of experience which changes you, just changes you in that way. Um, a real game changer, we might say. Well, last week, if you were here with us, we had the equivalent of that. Um, we sat in the cinema, as it were, and we watched as Paul showed us Christians who gave with rich generosity to gospel work, even out of their most severe trial and extreme poverty. And Paul's point then in giving us that picture was that that kind of rich generosity is the mark not of super spiritual, super heavyweight Christians, as it were, but of everyday, ordinary, unnamed believers like you and me. Like you and me. Um, And so as we looked at that picture, we noticed, we noticed their overwhelming joy. Do you remember that? The overwhelming joy. And we asked, how can anyone possibly put those two ideas together? Extreme poverty, yet overwhelming joy. And we imagined, didn't we, what would the lives of people like that be like? If we could spend a week with them, yeah, what, would, what would it be like in their homes to spend a week with them in that way? And we reflected, didn't we, how does this challenge my assumptions about the way I think about money? And then, so we saw that, as it were, in the cinema, and then we come out into our world. I don't know whether this happened to you last week, um, having spent time and looking at that particular passage. And we look around at the world that we live in, and what do you see? What do you see as you look around? Just, Just take a walk around, speak maybe, for instance, People caught in a kind of an endless cycle of consuming and having more and more. That's really what you'd see as you walk around our world, isn't it? Um, but still, but still being deeply unhappy, deeply unhappy, wanting what other people have. People desperately unhappy, and so much of that unhappiness kind of revolves around money. A world which thinks, well, everything would be better. If we just had some more money, yeah? That's the way that the, the world thinks, isn't it? So, so getting money becomes the number one priority. And, uh, and so relationships or personal integrity or anything else for that matter is kind of sacrificed on the altar as we go for that. And the, and the proliferation of gambling and um, discarded scratch cards, They tell that story, don't they? Give me more money. That's what I need uh, to have. And then if we're thoughtful, um, uh, we might step back and take a look at our own lives. Um, Would the way we think about our money be much different? We just talked there about the way the Spirit and the Word transforms the way we think. Would the way we think be an awful lot different to that picture that I've described to you? I want to say at the outset, the Bible isn't anti-money. Okay, the wisdom book of Ecclesiastes says this. It says money is the answer to everything. And we kind of, we understand that, don't we? But it also says this. Whoever loves money never has money enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. And so what God says to believers about money is as radical in our culture as what God says about Say, for example, sex, or what God says about forgiving our enemies, or what God would say about lying and so on. What God says about money is as radical as it is, as he says, as the things that he says about those kinds of things. And what God says, and what we saw this again and again last week, is this quite simply it's excel in giving. Excel. In giving. It's the mark of true believers to be radically generous with our wealth, to support the work of the church and meet the needs of the poor, and so on. And as we said last week, whatever that means, whatever that means, it certainly means giving generously to the forward push of the kingdom from the local church where God has put you. Not so the pastors can get a pay rise. 
We said that again last week. Not so that pastors get a pay rise or the church just gathers money into itself, but because the local church is the visible representation of Jesus Christ on earth. Did you know that? Looking at you today as I stand, look, you are the visible representation of Christ on earth. Lovely picture. A lovely picture. Okay? Um, and and, and you, you exist, we exist, don't we, to, 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 to fulfill the great commission to go and make disciples. That's what we're about as a church, isn't it? And the great command to love others as we love ourselves. So, and that costs money, as we, as we said last week. So I want to again say, as we said last, last time, if you're here as a visitor this morning, we do not want your money. We do not want your money. We hope, as you're here, it'll be eye-opening for you to see how attitudes to money and giving in God's kingdom are different to the way that the world thinks about these things and that however unusual it might seem it will attract you you will be attracted as you hear that to Christ who is the king of that kingdom that's really what we're about so actually I want to continue now in a really practical way do this uh, in this way I want to turn the message on its head, as it were. And I want to give you something really practical now. And I know many of you were here last week. I want us to take that idea about radical generosity, I want us to take it for a ride and see what it might look like in our lives. What might it look like for you here this morning for a believer to excel in giving like that, like that picture that we had uh, earlier in the chapter here? Now, I, want, I know that these verses say explicitly, too, that everyone must decide in his own heart when it comes to giving. So nobody can tell another person what he or she shouldn't give. That's important, and we'll see that. But at the same time, what might it look like to take God and his word seriously this morning with respect to radical generosity. We ought to see that, hadn't we? We ought to begin to think and to explore what that might look like. So here's a few scenarios. Is that okay? I'm going to say, call this one scenario one. And this could be for those people who are pretty practiced already in giving. Pretty practiced already. They're probably already giving upwards of 10%. 10 percent upwards at the moment in, this, in, that, in that way. But who know that willingness can wither. Willingness can wither. And once generous givers can quickly end up conforming to the pattern of the age without care. So what might it look like? Such people might sit down afresh and carefully work out over say 12 months what they need to spend to pay the mortgage to pay bills food maintaining things like a house or possibly a car maybe budgeting for a modest holiday appropriately providing for people who depend on them be it children or older family, maybe making a small provision for the future so that maybe in the area of a pension, so that they might not uh, burden unnecessarily others in, in later years in that way. And of course, if they sat down and did that practical exercise, it would need to be done recognizing that we live in a culture which tends to call luxuries necessities. Wouldn't you agree? So as they do that exercise, they'd have to remember that. that would have to be con they'd have to be conscious of that. And I take it that excelling in giving, in the way that we're looking at here, inevitably involves carefully thinking through what we're actually spending and making sure that, that, that we're not, we don't fall into that same trap. Now, having done that, and work out their total income over the same period, it would be possible to arrive at an amount for giving. And if, their income was, if your income was received uh, regularly, you could divide it up into 12 and you could give that amount out regularly. Okay, so that's, a, that's one possibility. That's a possibility for people who are already giving. What about scenario two? This could be for people who 
who presently aren't giving anything. Who presently aren't giving anything. What might that look like? Well, this is what that person might do. They might instead work out what their total income is before tax and before deductions and stuff and calculate what a tenth of that is, what 10% of that might be. And then make a start by giving that, by giving that. Then their planned spending, of course, would, be, would have to be based on 90% of what they currently get in instead of the, the usual 100%. A person who couldn't imagine how they could possibly ever make that work, but for who that, they thought, yeah, that makes sense in the light of what I'm reading here, and they really wanted to make a start, could, of course, sit down with a trusted Christian friend and receive the help and support from somebody that they trusted to see how that might work. And finally, here's a strategy to make sure a believer kept giving remarkably or generously, after they got going on scenarios one and two. Uh, call this scenario three. Um, imagine uh, you've got going and you receive an unexpected windfall um, over and above what your usual spending, your, your giving plans were. So what might, what might happen then? Well, um, after making my plans that I've done already, I might put aside a, a small predetermined amount, thinking, well, maybe this will happen. So if this happens, I'll put a small predetermined amount aside so I can celebrate and give thanks to the Lord. It might be I even plan a meal, maybe invite others to, to, to share with that with me in, in being able to celebrate and give thanks. And then all the rest, I might say I'm going to give away. I'm going to give away. Maybe a quarter might go to the church that I'm a part of, a quarter to a Christian charity that supports the persecuted church. A quarter might go to a local Christian endeavor. Maybe a quarter might go to a missionary uh, individual or family that I'm supporting. And having thought about it in advance and divided it up like that, that's what I've decided I'm going to do. Okay. For example, for example, I've just given you some examples. Um, that's all I've done here. All I've done is to suggest to you practically what overflowing generosity might look like. And I don't know how you're responding. I wonder how you're responding um, to the things that I've said. Here's a question. Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense to you, this idea of generous giving like that? Does it seem right because Paul says here, one of the ways that you know if you're a Christian, and there aren't all that many ways, actually, that you're able to prove in your heart you know, what the Lord is doing in your life, is that gift of generous giving makes sense to you. You may not know how you could ever do it, and that's different. But the question is, does it make sense to you this morning? Does it sound right to you? You see, because the, the Apostle Paul is writing to people who want to live like this, because he actually says, I know your eagerness to help, at the beginning of chapter 9. He says that to them. I know your eagerness to help. But they're stuck. But they're stuck. So we're going to use the time that remains now to see how he helps them to get unstuck, which would be a help to you if you're in that situation that the people that he was writing to were in. And the great news uh, we, we will see is that having received the gospel in your life, you have all that is necessary to make it a reality, to make this a reality. So let's, let's look in the bit of the Bible now that you've hopefully got open, page 818 on the church Bibles, chapter 9 and verse 6, Paul begins, remember this. Remember this. Last week, we had something to know. Overflowing generosity, this is the thing to know, overflowing generosity is the mark of the ordinary believer. Okay? Then we had something to work on. Do you remember? Work on your willingness. 
Don't focus in on the amount that you have or haven't, or you think you have or haven't got. Focus on your willingness. Work on your willingness. And now, lastly, we said we would look at this this week, something to remember, which is exactly how Paul begins here. Remember this, he says. Are you ready? Are you ready for what he says, remember? This is what he says. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If you're a Christian this morning, you believe the promise-keeping God. That's what a Christian is. Someone who believes in the promises of God. Well, that's a promise there, right there, that you've just read. If you remember nothing else today, remember that. Let me just say it again. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? It's, it's not a difficult image to grasp that Paul uses here. Just as a farmer will not have much of a harvest to reap if he doesn't sow quite a lot in the ground to begin with, a amount of seed, so the Christian will receive sparingly if he or she is tight-fisted in their giving. And on the opposite side of things, the Christian who, is, who overflows with generosity, like the farmer who sows generously into his field, can expect to reap generously. And remember too that one seed sown produces many seeds. Doesn't it? If you think about wheat, a kernel of wheat, if it falls to the ground and it dies, it just remains one seed a single seed but if it dies and goes into the ground it produces many seeds so the christian who gives generously will, will reap 30 50 or a hundredfold what he or she gives that is the picture that has been given here that is the promise do you believe it do you believe it if you believe it it changes everything so now look at verse 7 with me. And since verse 6, so we've just read that promise is true, then verse 7 is the inevitable consequence. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you're a Christian, you believe in the promises of God, and since God has promised in verse 6 that whoever gives generously will receive generously, then a Christian doesn't need to be told how much to give. That's obvious. Why wouldn't you give generously if verse 6 is true? You see? Let me show you what I, what I mean with, a, with, a, with an illustration. Um, if I said, if you give me £10 and I will give you £100 back and I was able to do that, well, how many of your £10 would you give me if I gave you £100 for every £10 you gave me? Would there be any end to the £10? You'd be looking everywhere for them. You would take every £10 that you had out, and you'd be looking under the bed for another one, you'd be begging and borrowing for another one, if I could give you 100 for every 10 that you gave me. Would you give me your £10 reluctantly? Would you give it to me grudgingly? Would you give it to me cheerfully? You bet you would. Yeah, You'd be giving it cheerfully, wouldn't you? Now, it's an illustration. And I'm not saying if you give £10 to the church, God is going to give you £100 back. But I am saying that God says, whoever sows generously will reap generously. That's what he says. Verse 6. And because that is true, no one who believes it will ever have to be told how much to give. Do you see, often the question is, well, how much do I need to give? And back in the Old Testament times, people gave a tithe and it was sort of 10%. And the question is, how much do I give? In fact, it was an awful lot more than that when you added it all up. It was probably more like a third of the total income that an Old Testament believer had. But you see, in the light of the promise that, 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 that is there... You'd never need to be told how much to give, would you? It's just obvious. I just give and give and give and give in generosity. You never hold anything back. 
There's a story in the Bible about a woman who got that. She really, really got it. And you, you probably know the story. It's in Luke chapter 21 and verse 1. Make a note of it if you want to. I'll read it to you. Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. Get the story now? He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. So she had two of these coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Two coins. She could have kept one and put the one in. She put them all in. She, out of her poverty, put all she had to live on. She knows verse 6 is true. And she also knows verse 8 is true. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We need to keep moving on. The encouragement to give continues in verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. He who supplies seed to the sower is not Dobbies. Okay? And he who supplies bread for food is not the Asda. Mm -hmm. Here it's the Lord God, isn't it? So one important thing this verse teaches is this. And honestly, it liberates the way a Christian person thinks about giving. It's this. All the wealth you and I have comes from God. All of it. Just stop and think about that for a moment. What you have is not what you've earned, as you might think, or, or what you've been entitled to. It's all of it, every single thing part of it has been given to you by God. The world, of course, says, what I've got is mine. I've earned it. I've worked hard for it. Um, I'm entitled to it. And I'm going to spend it on me because I'm worth it, the way the world would think. And yeah, so if you look at the adverts, you'll notice how many of them are based on that idea. You know, you deserve it. You're worth it in that way. God says, everything you have all that you possess, you have because I said you could have it. Isn't that great? And because that is true, God says, I have the right to tell you how, much, how you should think about it and what you should do with it. He says, before you say to yourself, I've earned it, remember you've earned it breathing the breath that I've given you with the mind I've given you for free with the opportunities I've given you. The fact that you are living today in this age, in this place, and not 2,000 years ago, say, in sub-Saharan Africa, is from me, God says. God even says the capacity to enjoy what you have comes from me. That's how sovereign he is. That's how big and massive God is. Everything you've got is as a result of my goodness to you. And I ask you now to share it, he says. Christians have a different attitude to giving because they know that all they have already is all from God. And you see this kind of thing with young people a lot, don't you? With, with, with young people. You buy them a, a bag of sweets. You, have you, been a, you know, you bought, bought a child a bag of sweets and... Um, you say, uh, you're five or ten minutes later, can I have a sweet? You've bought them the bag of sweets. And what do you get? No, you can't have my sweet. And just, yeah, just a sweet. No, you're not having my sweet. He said, I don't want, I don't want the whole bag. You're kidding me, aren't you? 
You're kidding. I just want a sweet. And if they do give you a sweet, they reluctantly take it out of the bag themselves and give it to you. So you, you can only, just in case you might take two by accident. And you, you think, I just, I just bought you those. You're kidding me, aren't you? Or imagine it like this. Someone buys you a massive house. Imagine somebody bought you a massive, beautiful house, 10 bedrooms, and they just wanted one room to live in. And you said, after they'd bought it for you, this house, no, you're not having that room to live in. And you'd say, you're kidding, right? And God comes to us with everything he's given us, and he says to us, how about sharing, I don't know, 10%? And you say, what? No way. It's mine. This stuff that I've got, it's mine. And he says, you're kidding, right? And when I, when I get stuck, I need to remember this stuff, don't I? When we get stuck on this giving thing, <laughs> we need to remember this stuff. And as I do, my thinking changes. And I can give generously because I know it all comes from him anyway. And he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will increase your supply of seed, it says. Not increase your bread. Did you notice that? Not increase your, but in, increase your supply of seed that you can give away and be generous again and again and again. Verse 11, here's how you know this is Christian giving, motivated by a Christian heart change. You will be made rich in every way, it says. How? A better house, a better car, better gadgets. Is that what it says? We look at it carefully. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and that your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God you know, you know the gospel of grace is alive in a person when they want to get wealthier so they can give it away. So they can give it away. And that's why all those TV evangelists and all that sort of prosperity stuff that you sometimes hear as Christians, particularly on the television, um, say, you know, give us your money and then you'll get this stuff back. That's why it's all completely false and completely dangerous because that's all about building you building yourself up so you can have more of what you want. And you see what the Bible's actually saying here. God will give you more so you can give it away. <laughs> now, that's, that, now that'll challenge where your heart is, won't it? Do you want to get more so you can give more away, actually? You know a person hasn't grasped what God says about money and giving. When, when they point to their stuff and say, look how God has blessed me. If I want a measure of how blessed I am of God, then it's this. How much money have I given in the past 12 months to the work of the church, the forward push of the gospel and the meeting the needs of poor people. That's a real sign of how I'm blessed. According to these verses, isn't it? Well, Paul closes out the chapter, continuing the theme at the end of verse 11, that generous giving is ultimately about the glory of God, bringing glory to him. Verse 12, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, which is fantastic, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, generous giving is a proof of the genuineness of our faith, it says there, because of this service by which you've proved yourself, men will praise God. There it is again, people praising God, glorifying God. Generous giving glorifies God. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel. Generous giving is a matter of obedience to the one we call Saviour and Lord, walking in obedience, the obedience of faith to him, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. So in those last bits, Paul kind of summarizes and he brings it all to a climax. It's all about the grace of God 
And he summarizes by saying, generous giving supplies the needs of God's people, supplies people's real needs, glorifies God, and sustains the giver with prayer for them and with a heart that feels God's love. So it's no wonder Paul's able to finish. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Well, I'm finishing up in a moment. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are about Christian giving. Three things. Number one, something to know. Overflowing generosity is the mark of a true Christian. Not super spiritual Christianity. This is Christianity 101. Ordinary Christians, even Christians living under severe trial and in extreme poverty. Secondly, something to work on. Work on your willingness. Don't start with what you think you have or you haven't got. You say, I'll give when I've got more. Um, As we've said before, you won't. You won't. You won't. Work on your willingness. And thirdly, something to remember. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you do, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. What matters as we come to the end is, does this make sense? You may be saying, I don't think I could do any of those three scenarios at the beginning. Well, well, okay. You may need help from someone to think that through. Probably, if you had to cope with, say, a 10% reduction in your income, you'd probably manage. You'd probably manage, wouldn't you? But what, what matters is, does it make sense? If it does, move in that direction. Start today. Make a plan. Be gutsy. Be gutsy. Finish here. There's a Bible passage in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. God says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, God says. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Test me in this, God says. Everywhere else in the Bible, God doesn't come to us as somebody needing to be proven. God is. He just is, isn't he? And yet he says, in this one matter, you can test me. (laughs) You see if I will not pour out so much blessing, you can't contain it. What's the blessing? It may or it may not be more money. If it is, it's only so that you might give it away generously anyway. What's the blessing? For some of us, it will be to stop worrying about money. For some of us, it would be to stop worrying about money. Perhaps, maybe for the first time. Maybe for the first time. Go on, try it. Just see if I don't, God says. I want to put blessing into your hand, but I can't put it into a clenched fist. He says, look what happened when Jesus opened his hand. In remarkable, supernatural generosity. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Look what happened when Jesus opened his hands. (laughs) Well, in a moment we're going to sing. Maybe the musicians can come and uh, prepare that for us. In the meantime, let's just bow our heads. Um, Just give you a moment.